In this lecture, we're going to talk about sigma and pi molecular orbitals and molecular orbital diagrams. Go back and watch the previous lectures on linear combination of atomic orbitals. And then how we name Garad versus Ungarad molecular orbitals, how they're built out of the same and opposite sign uh, wave functions when you're combining atomic orbitals. And with all that knowledge, we can move forward and talk about sigma and pi molecular orbitals. So in these diatomics, like we have here for hydrogen 2, H2, there's maybe atom A and atom B, just because we want to not show them both as the same atom and refer to them. There's going to be a symmetry here with respect to this internuclear axis. Okay, so it's really important to define things relative to this axis between these two atoms. That's our internuclear axis. Okay, and it turns out if the atomic orbitals are symmetric about this axis, these atomic orbitals that build the molecular orbitals, we call that a sigma bond. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, imagine an S orbital on atom A that looks like this. The one S orbital, it's all shaded the same color. Blue, right? Above and below the axis, it's the same sign. So it has a symmetry with respect to this axis. Okay, not in shape, but in sign. Same thing for the atomic orbital here. We're building the molecular orbital that is a combination of these two. But both of these have the same sign. They're both maybe positive. Maybe they're both blue if we're shading them. And there's extra density between from the overlap of these two atomic orbitals. Right? These are sigma atomic orbitals. So if both atomic orbitals are symmetric about this internuclear axis, this molecular axis, we call it sigma. Now, if both have a node, we call it pi. So what might that look like? Here's atom A, here's atom B. Again, this internuclear axis. If there is a node along this axis, right? So now the orbital looks like this, it's P. And there's nodes in these atomic orbitals. And importantly, we could look at the sign of the p orbitals, and it changes from top to bottom. All right, so now I'm coloring the bottom of the molecular orbital red, the top, uh, sorry, of the atomic orbital, uh, the bottom is red, the top is blue, because the sign of the wave function changes. And so it's not symmetric about this internuclear axis, it changes sign. That's going to be a pi orbital that's formed the molecular orbital formed from these atomic orbitals. Now, this can still be bonding, right? If I move these two close together, there's going to be an overlap from these two same signed things. That's still beneficial. That's still bonding. Okay, so you have to separate bonding, antibonding from sigma pi, from garad, ungarad. There are three different things that we use to denote a molecular orbital. Okay, so the naming of certain molecular orbitals is using these pi and sigma, this grat, ungrat, and this bonding or antibonding. So let's take a look at some different molecular orbitals. And here I'm going to replace my atoms with just dots. So here's atom A, here's atom B. The overlap of two S orbitals, right, might give you a shape like this. Where this is all the same color, the same shade. It is a sigma molecular orbital. Is it garad or ungarad? Well, I'm going to do the test like I talked about in the previous lecture, where I look at a point, if this is my zero in terms of x and y, I look at a point down here. Is it the same color, I should say, as the point up here? And the answer is yes, so it's garad. Okay, so this would be a sigma garad. And if it's the first one in my molecular orbital diagram, as we'll see, we'll call it the one, the first sigma garad orbital. Okay, and that's the bonding molecular orbital that we talked about in the previous lecture. We could have a antibonding orbital, right? And that would happen if on this first 
hydrogen, I have that sign, and I'm trying to combine it with the opposite sign, atomic orbital, here. There's not going to be an overlap, and actually what happens is you get this sort of forced smearing of the negative charge away from the other atom. And so the molecular orbital that forms here looks more like this. And now there is a complete node down the middle. This is still a sigma. Why? Because the internuclear axis here, the test for sigma is, is it the same sign, same color above and below this internuclear axis? The answer is yes, so it's sigma. But is a point down here the same color as a point up here? The answer is no, so it's Ungarad. Okay, so it's basically an inversion you're doing here and looking at the sign for Garad versus Ungarad. The symmetry with respect to the internuclear axis, top, bottom only, tells you sigma versus pi. Okay, so we might call this the one sigma Ungarad. And we also call it antibonding. Why? Because there is a node all the way down here between the two atoms. Okay, let's try one more. Let's try a overlap of two p orbitals. So I'm going to draw the atoms pretty close together. And now you can see the overlap of the p orbitals. I can still look at this certain axis. Again, the first test here is right along this internuclear axis, top to bottom, does the sign change? The answer is yes. It is pi. Now what about inversion symmetry? A point down here, does it change color to up here? Yes, it changes color. So that's uneven or ungarad. Now is it bonding or antibonding? Okay. And for bonding, we look between, is there electron overlap between the two nuclei? Yes, there was up here, it was bonding. Here there's a node all the way vertically, all the way up and down, antibonding. Here there is overlap between the two nuclei. It doesn't have to be directly along the intermolecular axis. Okay, so don't call this antibonding just because there's no electron density directly between the atoms. There is still between the atoms. It's just not along the internuclear axis. So there's an overlap between the atoms up here and between the atoms down here. Okay, so this is not antibonding, it's bonding. And this is the first pi Ungarad molecular orbital, so it still gets a one. Okay, so you can have all these ones here because they're the first molecular orbital of their type. Okay, so that's how we name these things. The number in front is just the energetic order of that molecular orbital type. So the lowest, you know, sigma will be one sigma. The lowest pi will be one pi. And technically, there's some rules for what we are or aren't allowed to combine. So here I was combining 1s with 1s or uh, 2p with 2p. But you can combine different types of atomic orbitals. So you could combine a 1s atomic orbital with a 1p atomic orbital, or sorry, 2p atomic orbital. 1p does not exist. The 2p atomic orbital. The changes sign here. And this will be allowed. So as long as we could call this maybe 2px here. As long as you can have this overlap like here that's beneficial, then these two could combine. Right? Now, 
The quantum number n here tells you something about the energy of that atomic orbital. And usually if these are different, right, especially for S and P, they're not really going to overlap. So usually a 1s atomic orbital doesn't overlap with a 2s atomic orbital. So this plus a larger 2s, usually those aren't close enough energetically to make a molecular orbital. And molecular orbitals tend to only be made from atomic orbitals that are similar in energy. So 1s and 2p probably doesn't combine, but 2s and 2p might. Okay. However, this 2s does not combine with 2pz, or 2py, I suppose. I'm drawing it up and down. Okay. And the reason is this is blue. This is an opposite sign. This is destructive interference here because the S is red. So whatever benefit I get from the top overlap of this 2PY and this 2S is negated by this overlap of blue and red. So the constructive interference here is destroyed exactly by the destructive interference. So these tend not to make molecular orbitals. So this is sort of our rule for what atomic orbitals will combine. 1s and 1s, yes. 2p and 2p, yes. 2s and 2p, only if it's this type of 2p. 2s and 2p of this, no. 2s and 3p, no. Too far away in energy. Okay, so the different atomic orbitals that combine to form molecular orbitals are dictated by their energies and the exact type of, say, x, y, z, p orbital they are. Now, if it is an S and P orbital that are combining here, we call this SP mixing. So if the S orbital and the P orbital are close enough in energy such that they can combine, they will, and you'll have SP mixing. And so the degree of SP mixing decreases as you go across the periodic table. because the energies of these atomic orbitals from which they're built is separating, right? Is, is getting larger. There's, there's becoming a larger gap between 2s and 2p as I go across the periodic table. So the sp mixing going across the periodic table decreases. And it decreases because the separation in energy between the S and the P orbital increases. And that's increasing because of shielding. Okay, so while you might have SP mixing in, say, uh, lithium-2, right, carbon-2, maybe nitrogen-2, you're not going to really have it in fluorine-2. Why? Because as you move across the periodic table to the right, you get more and more shielding. You have more 2p electrons to shield the other 2p electrons from the nucleus. So their energy gets pushed up further away from the 2s. And so once the gap between 2s and 2p becomes too large, then there's no overlap. For the same reason, there's no overlap between 1s electrons and 4s electrons because these are much different energetically. So again, as I go to the right on the periodic table, the p electrons, 2p electrons for, say, fluorine, are higher in energy because there's other p electrons shielding the nucleus than there are in, say, lithium or beryllium. Okay, so the greater shielding means that 2p, 2s gap widens, there's less overlap, and I can ignore the mixing. Okay, so now let's take a look at some molecular orbital diagrams. I'll skip ahead and actually show some figures here because these are way too hard for me to draw. These are the sigma and pi molecular orbitals we were talking about. Here's how we name them with regard to antibonding bonding, sigma or pi. And here's the sp mixing as I go from, say, lithium, boron, nitrogen. Notice here that this is the orbital that we'll care about, right? That 2px, that one that could overlap with my s. Why? Because this left side of the p orbital is the same size sign as the s. 
the right side is not, but it's not overlapping, so that's okay. So this is the one that's being affected as I move across the periodic table. Why? Because again, the gap between the 2s and the 2p atomic orbitals that form this sigma molecular orbital, that gap is getting larger. Okay? And so you can also have not only this sp mixing effect, but just the atomic orbitals in general that form the molecular orbitals are changing size. So the molecular orbitals change size. So here I'm graphically showing uh, these molecular orbitals I, I built in this program called Gaussian, calculated for hydrogen 2 versus fluorine 2. And the atomic orbitals are much more compact on fluorine, so you get molecular orbitals that are much more compact. right? Whereas on hydrogen, the atomic orbitals are larger, so there's more overlap, and you get this oval shape. For here, the molecular orbital that's built of the two atomic orbitals looks basically like two atomic orbitals. Because there's not a ton of overlap, these two s electrons, or one s electrons, are really close to each nuclei. Whereas in hydrogen, they're much more diffuse. Why? Because there's only one proton and that one electron. Whereas here, things are much smaller because there's a ton more protons attracting that 1s electron. And so the size affects the energy, the number of protons affects the energy, which can affect sp mixing, which can affect the sort of diffuseness of these molecular orbitals built out of these atomic orbitals. Okay, so here's uh, the molecular orbital diagram we were showing uh, last lecture for hydrogen. We talked about Garad versus Ungarad molecular orbitals. We can have these molecular orbital diagrams where you fill them up. Notice for helium, helium-2 is not stable. Why? Because this is too high of an energy. H2 is stable because you don't have the electrons to put up here. Helium-2 is not stable because now you have occupied molecular orbitals and those energies are way too high. Right? So in helium, where you have to consider both this bonding and antibonding molecular orbital, that's not beneficial. So what happens? You get a total molecular orbital energy that is basically unbound. The helium-2 does not really exist, and the atoms fall apart. Okay, so chemical bonding, again, is explained by these molecular orbital diagrams most of the time. There's always exceptions. The total energy is not just the sum of these, but usually it's a good approximation. So we can build this out and go from hydrogen to helium to fluorine even, where we really have a lot of molecular orbitals built from these atomic orbitals. And just to point out a few things here for the diagram of fluorine 2. The first thing we notice is that we know this sp gap is large, right? So between 2s and 2p, there's a lot of energy here. Right, so again, this is my energy axis. This gap is large. So it's not like 2s is going to mix with 2p. These are separate. And so my 2s orbitals only interact with my other 2s orbitals. Okay, so no sp mixing here. The second thing is there's no 1s. There is a 1s molecular orbital built down here, but it's separated as well. So there's no 1s, 2s mixing either. The 3 sigma g and 3 sigma u are split much greater, right? This to here is much greater than the split between these two. And they're all built from p orbitals. Why is that the case? Okay, it's the case because where these orbitals are pointing, right? The overlap here. When the atomic orbitals are pointed along the internuclear axis, that is a lot more energy than the limited amount they're able to overlap here. Right? They're not really overlapping here. They actually are a little bit, it's just not drawn very well, but there's minimal overlap here, whereas here you can really see the atomic orbitals are overlapping. So there's a huge benefit for these 2px orbitals that make this sigma orbital. And there's a little bit of benefit here for the two PY and PZs. And so this is 
slightly more stable here compared to the separate atomic orbitals, whereas this one is much more stable, again, because of this overlap. And it's symmetric in the case that this goes up a lot more because there's this anti-bonding overlap. Okay, and you see how these things are named, again, with numbers according to what sigma g orbital it is. There's one s's down here that have their own one sigma g molecular orbital. So this would be the second sigma g. This would be the third sigma g. And so this is my molecular orbital configuration. One sigma g, one sigma u star, two sigma g, two sigma g star, three sigma g, so on and so forth, just counting each of these up. Much like I have an electron configuration in an atom of 1s2, 2s2, right, 2p6, etc. So this is the form we write for molecular orbitals versus atomic orbitals. Okay, the last thing I want to mention just here for sort of completeness, you've probably heard of this back in general chemistry, but bond orbital, bond order. Stable bond formation requires more electrons in these bonding ones than antibonding. So bond order here, all we're really worried about is taking one half of the total bonding electrons minus the total antibonding electrons. Higher the bond order, more stable this will be. Okay, so you can calculate the bond order here by adding up all of these bound, uh, sorry, all of these bonding molecular orbitals. There will be one sigma g, two sigma g, 3 sigma g, 1 pi u, 1 pi u. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. The bond order for fluorine here would be 10 minus how many antibonding? Well, there's a 1 sigma u star not shown from the 1s atomic orbitals. There's a sigma star here. So that's 2, 4, 6, 8. And the bond order is 1 half, 10 minus 8. So the bond order for fluorine is one. Okay, heteronuclear diatomics you can get into. We're not going to discuss at length, but basically what changes here is, well, the weighting coefficients aren't the same. We can jump into this in another lecture, but for now I think we'll just end things here for homonuclear diatomics, talking about the molecular orbital diagram for fluorine, how sp mixing can affect the shape and energies of these molecular orbitals, and how the order of the molecular orbitals might change due to that sp mixing as well. So that'll do it for this lecture. You can go back and watch my previous lectures building up to this point. As we move forward, we'll build out molecular orbital theory a little bit more. But that's it for today. See you next time.